Welcome to the Veterinary Pulse podcast. My name is Jordan Benchia. I'm the executive director of the VIN Foundation. Veterinary Pulse is the heartbeat of the profession. Join us as we talk with veterinary colleagues about critical topics from student debt to mental health and share stories. Stories connect us as humans, as animals, as a veterinary community. This podcast is made possible through individual donors like yourself and our technology partnership with VIN, the Veterinary Information Network. Thank you for being here. This episode, we're having a discussion with Hillary Levitin, resident and recent graduate of University of Illinois. She shares her story of finding resilience amidst a zigzag path and her passion for supporting veterinary colleagues. Thank you for listening. Hi, Hillary. Thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. When did you first realize you wanted to be a veterinarian? So really similar to a lot of the people who do choose to become veterinarians, I really, really loved animals as a child. Um, It was funny. I didn't really even have a lot of pets. We had a frog, which I don't even like amphibians now, but that was my first pet. Um, And I just was fascinated with animals and and how they worked. Um, And then kind of the older I got and I got to really observe the relationship between pets and their owners, specifically like our dog um, and our family was when I really chose kind of made more of that adult decision to say, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to strengthen this bond, maintain this bond between animals animals and people for as long as possible. That's interesting. And and the fact that you had a frog and that was (laughs) not your, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, was not encouraging of the profession, but (laughs) no, it's funny because I actually, I remember going to, um, the exotic store to, to pick out this pet. And I ended up picking out an albino frog and my parents were like, why do you want that frog? It looks it looks kind of weird. And I go, well, yeah, I can see all of its organs. Isn't it cool? And they probably thought I was a very odd child, but they did get me the frog. (laughs) So that might've been an indicator early on. Yes. I think I was only like seven or eight years old. And I was like, yeah, it's skin is see-through. That looks perfect. (laughs) (laughs) I love what kids think are so interesting early on in the, in the years. It's it's great. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I I then grew to love more of the, the furry creatures, cats, dogs, more traditional animals for a small animal vet, (laughs) but, but yes, it took a little time. (laughs) Hey, frogs need love too. They do. He was very cute. (laughs) (laughs) So when you decided, like you liked animals early on, but then when you were an undergrad, were you the whole time, were you focused on veterinary school? I was, I was. So in undergrad, um, I was very, very focused on my animal science degree. That's what I got my undergraduate degree in, um, as a lot of veterinarians do, but not all. Um, And so I was very, very focused on moving forward with that and applying to vet school. And it was certainly a really heavy task because, you know, your classmates and advisors, I'll tell you the statistics of getting into vet school, which can be a little scary. Um, There aren't quite as many in the country as there are medical schools. Uh, But certainly one of my biggest cheerleaders was my dad, um, kind of always telling me, well, no, Hillary, it's not if you get in, it's when you get in, like, don't worry, this is something you want, you can do it. Um, And in fact, it was his relationship with our dog in particular, as he was ill for really most of my life uh, that kind of spearheaded my my mission of being a veterinarian. Uh, So yes, I was definitely very driven in undergrad to fulfill that task. That's wonderful that you had a a model and your dad to both encourage you to know, you know, with the confidence that you could do this and at the same time to see the bond between him and your dog. Yeah, it was, it was pretty incredible. I mean, he uh, had a congenital heart disease that caused him to go into heart failure. So a lot of my uh, really young childhood memories even were helping to take care of him, which is probably one of the reasons too, I, why I got so fascinated with medicine. You know, I was like, 11 years old and wrapping his IV pump at home in plastic material so it wouldn't get wet um, and just like bringing him our our family dog when he 
didn't really have enough strength to talk to humans and just wanted to have someone there who could lay there with him. So um, that was certainly like a really, really big driving force for me to learn more about medicine and, and kind of help other people who might be, you know, sick at home <laughs> was uh, to, to be a vet. <laughs> That's such a touching story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, for sure. And did you know where you wanted to go to veterinary school? Did you have that in your plan? Yeah, I did. And so being kind of a part of this family and wanting to help my mother and my sister, I, I really wanted to stay close to home. Um, in addition to that, I loved going to do my undergraduate degree at the U of I so much. <laughs> so my hope was to stay at the University of Illinois and continue my education there. Um, but I had looked at some other state universities, some other private universities for veterinary school. Um, but ultimately, the U of I was my choice because at the time they were one of the few curriculums that actually had more of an integrated curriculum where you had both your coursework, but also rotating through the clinical floor um, throughout all four years of vet school, as opposed to just the last year, which is what more standard programs do. And did you get in right when you applied or with your dad saying, don't worry, it's when, <laughs> not if, did you wait? No. I'm just kind of curious yeah. because you hear some veterinary students that are like, I'm going, like for instance, in California, if there's UC Davis and Western, they say, oh my gosh, I'm just going in wherever I can get. Yeah. If I don't get into Davis, I'm going to Western, even though it might cost them, you know, yes. multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars more, oh my gosh, right? Yes. So I'm curious how that yeah, and it's it's a really good question because on on the one end, like yes, I always really wanted to go to U of I because of how their program was set up, but then there was also in the back of my mind like ooh, in-state tuition, that is also very valuable. Um, and so I did actually apply right away um, to vet school straight out of undergrad, but when I was submitting my applications and getting everything ready, my dad actually passed away. Um, and so that was a really challenging time to kind of make sure that I was submitting everything correctly. Um, and there was actually a very unfortunate circumstance where something um, didn't go through for my University of Illinois application, whereas like everything uploaded successfully for all my other applications. And so I actually did get into vet school um, at a couple different out-of-state universities, uh, but they did not look at my U of I application because thing, there was some sort of error on, on the submission end. Uh, I was very devastated. That was a very challenging time for sure. And I thought a lot about it. You know, do I go to one of these other programs that I wasn't as in love with and also pay a higher tuition fee or do I wait and apply again next year? And ultimately I did wait the year and I worked in a private practice and actually am still best friends with one of the girls I worked with there. She's also a veterinarian now. <laughs> um, and I got into the University of Illinois as soon as I applied the following year and then started vet school. So really that year off was probably a blessing in disguise to give me a little bit more time to kind of process everything going on in my life and then start vet school nice and fresh. Wow, that must have been so hard for you. I mean, in some ways, <laughs> yeah, it's like you're fulfilling your dad's dream, right? Or, yeah. or his belief in you. And then for that to happen and then, oh gosh, and for it not to submit correctly, you know, I actually, <sighs> we interviewed a third year um, Kamira Patel at UC Davis yeah. and she said that she had gotten her application in really early because she had heard that there had been issues like sometimes yes. recommendations or things like that did not come in time and she's like and I just did not want to chance any of that right, right. and at, at the end of the day like it's still a system right so you're yeah. still kind of like bound by these things which you're like yes okay there's nothing fair about this right yes <laughs> to, your, to your point I think having that time probably as you said gave you the time to reflect and get that experience and apparently make a best friend yes. and <laughs> do Very those true. things, right, which probably benefited yeah. you down the line. So, I mean, kudos to you for, for doing that. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, it was definitely well worth it. And certainly when you have different hiccups in life in order to roll with the punches and be okay with it, you really do need to find these silver linings 
in those moments. And I definitely pride myself in doing that. Uh, but it, it certainly was a, a good experience. And actually my really dear friend that I met at that at that workplace, um, she ended up being in my class in vet school. So then we got to be very dear friends for many years in vet school. <laughs> Gosh, it's so true. Finding resilience in life, right? I mean, this, yes. I mean, this year alone has just been, yes. I'm sorry, what is happening? Um, uh, and just being able to find resilience in the midst of it. And that's a great quality to learn, albeit yeah. never an easy one, right? Yeah, but certainly never easy. Therapy helps. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Always encourage therapy. And if anyone out there needs peer-to-peer -peer support, we do have a Vets for Vets. Yes confidential support group um, for all veterinary students and veterinarians. It's free. We're just here to help. And it's true. Just talking to somebody makes a big difference. Oh, yes. That's such a helpful resource. It's very, very good to be able to share that with people. Yeah. So when you graduated from veterinary school, I love to ask sort of what was your plan for your veterinary yeah. career? <laughs> uh, well, it's just so funny you ask that because it's when you're done with vet school at that point, you're just so jazzed about having all of this knowledge and you want to get your feet wet, but then you also have all of these doors open to you. And I remember always being very, very intrigued by my neurology coursework, um, thinking that that was just like the most fascinating topic, but I was also just super intimidated by the idea of pursuing a residency. I mean, you hear about certain environments that sound awesome and other environments that sound maybe less awesome and more um, to have some degree of hazing, which I think that is now falling out of favor, which is great. Um, but it's certainly a scary prospect, even if you have the interest in a specific specialty. So what I did, which I thought was um, kind of the most pragmatic was I just thought, well, what is the decision that would keep my options as open as possible while I figure this out? Um, and to do that would be to do a rotating internship. So I applied to rotating internships and was lucky enough to get my first choice for the match. Um, and I did do a rotating internship at a very busy private practice in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. Um, and so like really my plan when I graduated was to survive my rotating internship <laughs> and then decide at that point if I wanted to specialize or to stay in emergency medicine where I could still do kind of, uh, or rather where I could still live a very high paced um, environment um, as being a veterinarian, but have more of that versatility um, and variation day to day. And so how did you like that internship experience? Yeah, it was it was definitely a very challenging year. I think anyone who does a rotating internship will tell you that. Um, but I honestly loved it. I had really incredible support, um, met very wonderful mentors um, that I still chat with and highly respect both personally and professionally. Um, and it's really there that I became a doctor. I mean, it's it was just. Um, a very, very nice environment where I knew that they actually cared about me, not just as a veterinarian, but as a human being, which is definitely something you want to look for in a rotating internship because they tend to be very rigorous programs. Um, so I, I definitely would not have wanted to do it anywhere else. And I would do it again, even though it was very, very exhausting. <laughs> Sometimes those experiences, while exhausting, are definitely worth it. Yes, absolutely. And I remember there was one week that was just particularly rough. I had so many euthanasias come in through the emergency room, which can just be very um, stressful and obviously sad, of course. And uh, one of the staff members there could tell that I was very down. And the next day she just brought me the largest box of miniature donuts I've ever seen. Like just for me, the entire box, she brought a separate box for the staff. Wow. <laughs> so I squirreled them away. I probably ate like 20 miniature donuts that day, um, but it was, it was very sweet and uh, I really enjoyed them. <laughs> well, that they're just so good at filling the holes, you know? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. It filled every single hole I had inside me. <laughs> sugar. <laughs> not, not at all eating the emotions. Not at all. Never, never. <laughs> so after you finished your rotating internship, what was next on your plan? 
Yeah. So after my rotating internship, because it, it really wasn't until the end of my rotating internship, actually, that I decided, um, yes, I, I do really want to pursue a residency. But now, now that I loved my rotating internship so much, I'm very torn on whether I still want to do neurology, which was always my primary interest in school, or if I wanted to pursue critical care. Um, I just really liked managing those very, very sick patients um, and helping to, to pull them out of that place or providing you know, guidance for people in terms of their decision making for end of life, right? Um, even though that's very sad, it's also really rewarding because people people need that assistance. And I feel as an empath that, you know, I can help with that. Um, and so after my rotating internship, I was lucky enough to actually do a specialty internship where I got to focus on both um, um, critical care and neurology. So I worked back and forth between both services. Wow, that sounds like a great opportunity. Yeah, it was it was pretty awesome. I was able to get some research experience under my belt um, in doing a project with the neurology team at the University of Illinois um, and get to know them a bit more even beyond the level of a student, obviously, since I went there for um, my veterinary school. So it was great to get to know them on more of a doctor to doctor basis and have them get to know me on a doctor basis. Um, and also do some of these other emergency procedures that I really enjoy doing uh, that are not at all related to neurology. Uh, but certainly the farther I got along in that program, um, the more that my my, my heart and my mind just kept pulling me towards neurology. Uh, and I just, I just had to pursue that goal. At this point, you've fulfilled your dream of going to veterinary school. You <laughs> yeah. fulfilled your dream of an internship um, and a great rotating internship. You fulfilled your dream of a specialty internship. So yeah. what happens next? Yeah. And so I, I always like to tell people that my path was a bit of a zigzag because it almost seems like in every next step of my life, I'm like, OK, what's the next step? Right. Because, um, you know, we have these big goals, but for a lot of people, our big goal is being a vet. And then you've got to find these other goals. Right. What am I going to do with this? And so uh, after I did the specialty internship. Um, I unfortunately did not match for a residency right away, um, but that's okay. I actually, uh, when I did not match for a residency, I did end up doing uh, emergency work for several months. I actually went back to the practice where I did my rotating internship because I loved it there so much um, because the, the doctors knew me there quite well. They preferentially gave me dibs on all of the neurology cases, which was awesome. <laughs> um, and and, you know, growing, I actually grew up in Chicago. And so being so close to Chicago, working in emergency, I was uh, allotted the opportunity to have a more relaxed schedule than when I was an intern. And I, I got to do a lot of really fun things. I mean, me and my dog went on these beautiful long walks and jogs along Lake Michigan, where it's very picturesque. And I got to walk to a little pie and coffee shop and really just live my, my best life for a little bit of time and let me kind of recuperate and become very well rested. And then I did ultimately get my residency position and was so excited, but certainly those six months were still very well spent. It, it actually allowed me a good amount of time to, to feel energetic again about learning. As you can imagine, after two internships, I was very tired. <laughs> I can, I'm tired just hearing about it. <laughs> I, right? It's, it's exhausting. I don't know how I'm still here. <laughs> Lots of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Always coffee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> can you take us back for a moment and explain to us how the matching process works oh, yes. for residents? Yes, yes. And so for residents in veterinary medicine, and I believe it's similar in human medicine as well, the match is a very odd process. And so basically, um, it's almost like you're picking your top 10 favorite places that you want to go for a residency where you'd like to pursue that residency. And these individual institutions then are going to rank their ideal candidates in the order that they prefer as well. So of course you rank your most favorite to second favorite, third, et cetera. Um, and so it's it's really this, this wacky way to match programs with individuals. Um, and what, what makes, the reason why I say it's wacky, I mean, it sounds like it should be good in theory, right? Everyone deserves to be matched with 
the person they like the best that they feel fits their program the best is certainly a better way to say that. Um, but what ends up happening sometimes is that it can be a bit random. And so, you know, let's say you have a candidate that is so, so excellent, but maybe there's another candidate who has just one more year of experience. So that other candidate is ranked first and this still very strong candidate is ranked second. So if every single institution gets their number one choice, then that still extremely amazing number two choice may not get a, a quote unquote match, may not match for a position. Um, and so that's why it can be a really, really challenging process is that there are so many strong candidates out there seeking these kind of advanced degrees, um, but not always the equal amount of positions. So that's how it works is this odd trying to match up everyone's list with one another. And is there an interview process? What is the process to determine yeah. that match? Is this just to walk us through that a bit if you're up for it? Oh, for sure, for sure. And so the way this works typically is there, there are some programs and I, I do believe that for rotating internships, they may do this step a bit more than for residencies, um, but there is a level of the application where your grade point average needs to be a certain amount for them to like keep you in their stack, right? Like they wanna make sure that you are a certain percentage in terms of the top of your class. Now, if you get past that level, um, that's when they start to really look at more of your application. Um, for some residency programs, everyone gets an interview because they wanna be able to see that individual's interpersonal skills, uh, make sure that they are an individual that is not only strong academically, but also um, in regards to their communication to make sure they can communicate with the team well, but also their clients. There are other programs where it, being given an interview or invited to interview is already giving you a leg up because they don't offer interviews to every person. Um, so that can be challenging to navigate as well. And you really have to be paying attention on these websites to say, all right, is this a program that wants me to initiate this or are they initiating it? It's not just one standard rule rule for everyone. Um, and so once you get past the interview process, then you basically just have to wait for match day. So it's like a day in February where the match results are released and it's actually quite public. Like you see where everyone matches. So if you are an individual that didn't match, then like people know. So it can actually be a really emotional day for people. I can imagine. I mean, I'm thinking... I'm well older than you, but for my generation, I'm sort of thinking <laughs> kind of like back in the day where it's like, and like you would see in so many movies, like you're wondering if you've made the squad in whatever version yes. this is for you or the play yeah. or like your role. And like yeah. all the kids run up to the board to see if yes. their name, and there's like instant shame feeling if like your name's not on there, right? Exactly. And then you kind of like just want to like, oh, I just kind of want to go into a corner. And yeah. then like the people's names that are up there, they obviously, they, everybody knows. So they're super yes. popular instantly. <laughs> and, and then, <laughs> and then like the ones that in your name's not there and you're like, oh my gosh. Right. Yes. Um, but then with this whole world of digital, everything, it's like, so much more public, right? Yes. And and that's gotta be, oh my gosh, that's gotta be so in some ways petrifying and yes. and so tough. I mean, how yeah. so I mean if you're up for sharing with us, I'd love to know kind of how it was in your position not matching because oh yeah I mean, I've spoken with you for a while a little while and it's clear that you are like full go-getter, totally on top <laughs> of it. And you just think like wow, like here's somebody that I would just presume off the bat matched, right? But to your point, right. there's always wonky things with systems and that's, yeah. you know, it's, it's tricky. So I'd love to hear a bit more about your story if you're up for yeah. sharing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so when I did not match, I was deeply, deeply devastated. Um, very, very much so. I remember just crying, seeing the results on my computer, being very, very upset, um, especially given that I was still like in the midst of doing an academic program when I didn't match, right? I was doing a specialty internship. I had done two internships. I had worked on research projects, like had papers published and still did not match, right? So it kind of felt like everything I was working towards was 
crashing down around me. And I had finally started to kind of see my life all put together, right? I'm living in this town with my wonderful partner, who's now my husband. We own a home. And I was just, it kind of felt that my life was finally all falling into place. And then just as is the theme, I guess, for my life, every time something feels just about right, I get another zigzag. <laughs> um, and so, you know, this was another one of those. Um, and it was, it was really, really challenging. And I remember just being heartbroken. Uh, but beyond that, the first thing I thought of was, well, I've been working at this for many years and I, I really felt that I had a strong application and I wanna know what I can do to make it better. Why was this not enough uh, for, for these programs? And so um, the day that I didn't match, I emailed my supervisors and said that I wanted to set up a meeting for the following day if they could accommodate me to go over my application and see what truly they are looking for in an applicant and what what I could improve upon because I'm not going to continue to apply for a residency the following year if if I don't know what I can do better given that I felt I was already giving it everything that I had um, and that was really tough for me to do because you know going to meet with them this was also a program I didn't then get into right so that's a bit awkward but you put on your big girl pants because that's what life's about. And I, I met with them and, you know, we had a fairly productive meeting. Uh, it's, it was definitely a challenging day. And so I'm taking more pauses. <laughs> uh, it was definitely uh, a challenging day, especially to hear a lot of honestly positive feedback and then words to the effect of there were just so many strong candidates that it was hard to choose. And when you're one of the people that, you know, they say was hard to choose between, but you still didn't get it. It's, it's very heartbreaking. And um, similar to other times in my life, I gave myself a day or two to feel really bad about myself. And then I said, okay, that's enough. <laughs> You've had your day or two. And now it's time to go back there and prove them why they were really wrong. And, <laughs> you know, all those programs that didn't want me prove them while they were really wrong and kind of push ahead and, that's what I did. And I ended up finishing my research project, um, or I suppose this was more of a case report, but I finished my case report I was working on that year and went into private practice for several months. And I, I like to believe that it was that kind of mentality uh, that ended up lending me the support to then end up getting the position in the end. Um, I just really wanted to, to work hard to be the kind of person that I envisioned myself to be in my mind, you know? Uh, so that's what I did. There are so many times in life where we find ourselves needing to just swallow our ego, you know? Yes. <laughs> and the willingness to be vulnerable and to go back and say, okay, I really want this. And how yes. do I do this again? And I found myself in a couple of those situations in my life and just being really clear, like, this is something I really want. And yes. I, I want to know what is it that you what am I doing wrong? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how can I, you know, how can I improve? Right. And it, it must've been hard to an extent hearing like, yeah, you're doing nothing wrong. You're doing everything right. You're like, I'm sorry. Cause I've checked all my boxes. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, almost made me feel worse, but no, I mean, it, it definitely was hard, but I, I am a very strong believer in, you know, if you don't say what you're thinking and you don't say what you need or what you want, people will not know. No one can read your mind. So you have to be able to speak what you're thinking if you want to get anywhere. You just have to. So I wanted them to know I wanted it and help me to know how to get it. <laughs> I'm almost seeing this pattern in your life where in a couple instances, like the not getting into veterinary school initially and then getting in and similar with this residency where I think you found resilience during that. And it's also provided you an opportunity to, that you've taken advantage of to, like you were saying, the time with your dog and that time with yourself. And those are precious moments, right? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing more precious in our life than our time, right? We're not getting yeah. any more of that, you know? Yeah. And to be able to have that time first, you know, before veterinary school and then before your residency, that's actually, it's almost like a gift that we didn't expect, right? I mean, with COVID, yes. I think that there's a lot of things, there's a lot of negative without a doubt, right? But there For are sure. aspects of potential positive that people are finding of 
the quality time with their loved ones, yes. um, you know, and other things that, and the time that slows them down a bit that if they're yes. taking the time to look can be really beneficial, right? Oh, I totally agree. Where you say a zigzag, I, I, I'm shift, <laughs> shifting that to resilience with an opportunity. <laughs> well, thank you. I like that so much better. <laughs> but yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's just... I, I've said very similar things about the pandemic. I mean, it's just heartbreaking what's happening in the world. And the only solace I take in it is that I hope it's a wake up call for a lot of people to just slow down, like be with your loved ones, really pay attention to what's important to you. Cause especially here in America, our work culture is just so stern work, work, work. Uh, and so I think it's a really good reminder to people to slow down. And I've had those reminders myself in my life, but you know, I, I hope that not as many people have had to, you know, kind of go through those types of hardships in terms of deaths in their family. But I, I do hope that COVID helps to remind people you know, what's important to them. You're now towards the end of your residency, correct? Uh, yes, I have 86 days left. So not that you're it, counting. <laughs> yes, I would <laughs> never. I mean, I did maybe start counting once I got into the double digits, <laughs> had not before. But yeah, I am just about done. It's very exciting. So what's the next step in your veterinary career? Yeah, so um, I'm really excited that for the first time in my life, I'm going to be moving out of Illinois. My husband and I are going to be moving to Austin, Texas, where I've accepted a private practice position there, um, where there is one other neurologist. So I'll have uh, kind of a more seasoned neurologist there with me to, to pick her brain um, and for her to pick mine. And I'm just really, really thrilled about taking this next step of my career, especially having been in academia now for a while, but starting in private practice, I'm, I'm happy to get back to more of that fast paced environment. Have there been resources that you have relied on so far in your veterinary career? Or are there ones that you or places that you found like it'd be really helpful if I had this and that doesn't exist? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I honestly and this is it's a very interesting question you bring up because uh, right now just with how kind of emotionally taxing the veterinary profession can be. Certainly, there are a lot of really amazing facets of our profession, um, but I'm sure most people who listen in know also about kind of the emotional weight of this job. And so, you know, for me, something I've talked about with my colleagues is creating a network, which I mean, it probably is not dissimilar to the network that you guys have, have been creating as well um, for different veterinarians to be there for other veterinarians. And uh, I know something I wished existed when I was more of a new graduate or even in vet school um, was to almost have a, a real mentor. I mean, you're assigned an advisor in school, but just because you're assigned an individual doesn't mean that that's someone that you're really going to match well with on a communication level. Um, and it would have been really, really nice to be able to express some of the struggles of just balancing you know, that work-life balance and, and other things with someone more senior. So, you know, whether that is um, something similar to the programs offered through the VIN Foundation, or if there's um, other types of networks so that they're, you know, within specialty or within age groups, whatever it might be. Um, I just, you know, that's something that I've kind of carved out for myself in terms of making relationships with other kind of more senior residents to myself, right, in my field, um, that definitely would have been helpful. And I think something else that would be really, really helpful would be if there were more wellness initiatives for residents and interns, um, especially given that there aren't as many regulations in regards to the hours worked like there are in human medicine, because uh, that can that can really affect an individual when you're working, you know, 80 hour work weeks and, and expected to still stay on tax on task, excuse me. Um, so I hope one day that there's just a bit more regulation as to how um, those programs are run across the board. Yeah, you bring up a good point there. You know, that's something that we the reason that we started Vets for Vets is because we are finding that there were a lot of colleagues struggling and there was this huge yeah. sort of symbiotic relationship of veterinarians being able to speak to veterinarians, you know, in this peer-to-peer yes. -peer support level. And we've, I mean, we've definitely yeah. seen an increase in the last year, but just in general, you know, Vets for Vets works with veterinary students and new grads and everything. And 
I think there's, there's probably a lot of benefit there. I like your idea about a mentor. I mean, Vets for Vets does match. Like if people come in and they're looking for a mentor or someone that's kind of been through what they've been before, we try to match people up that way. And we have mentors ready and wanting to help. And I, I can imagine though yeah. that, um, obviously we're doing a poor job of outreach because you didn't know that existed. <laughs> But that's I'm no, that's sorry. not your fault. That's our <laughs> fault completely. That's my fault. That's our fault. A hundred percent. I mean, I'll take the blame. Um, because that's our goal is just to help, right? It's all free. And yeah. uh, but that I can imagine that would be very helpful. And so it's great that you're doing that for some residents as well and some interns and and helping yeah. the younger generations, right? I mean, our goal always the foundation's yeah. goal. And just in general, we want to, we believe that by helping one, we will ideally be able to help more, right? With the idea that yes. they'll be able to leapfrog the mistakes and not have to recreate them every single time, yeah. you know? Oh, for sure. For sure. And that's what I try to even impress upon the students. Like I'm very, very vocal about how they need to be taking care of themselves so that they can take better care of their patients, right? Like we can't, we can't have good patient care and good client communication if we're not taking care of ourselves. Um, and so if I see a student struggling, I, I talk to them and see what I can do to, to help them um, in that day or if they need something more than that, you know. Um, but I think it's just really important that we notice when other individuals are struggling so that we can help. And I'm sure that's true of every profession, um, but especially right now since you know there's there's such an issue with veterinarians with um the struggles that we're facing not just covid related but you know compassion fatigue is is a real thing <laughs> so you know we just have to take good care of each other i really applaud you for helping helping those um that need that because i think that's a really important and really important thing to do. And you're being a great resource on your own. So thank you. Oh, that's really kind. Yeah. I just, I just want to help other people who may be feeling the way I had felt at some point in my life, because there were struggles, but you know, I, I got through it and other people can too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> what areas in the veterinary profession are you enjoying most at this time? So I would say right now, what I've been really enjoying um, doing quite a bit more is talking and working more with our referral community directly. Um, you know, we, we've always taken phone consultations and, and chatted with other veterinarians about cases, um, kind of on a more specialty to primary care uh, basis. But now with the pandemic and people limiting their travel and maybe not wanting to come to a congested university, uh, we do have a lot more of our patients following up with their primary care providers, uh, which is absolutely great. Um, just being able to have more of that vet to vet communication, as, as we've alluded to before, has been really nice. Um, just it's, it's so funny how much uh, more I don't, I don't want to use the word friendly, but it's just, it's just interesting to see how much more interactive vets to vets are now on the phone. Whereas, you know, before we're so busy just trying to keep the day moving and now people are checking in with one another, like, Hey, are you still doing curbside? What's it like where you're at? Oh, wow. You know, there's a lot more of this exchange of, of situations by phone. Um, and I just really, really enjoy chatting with vets about cases where, you know, it's, it's a little different than talking to clients. They understand the medical terminology and we can speak the same language. Uh, so that's something I've actually enjoyed doing that I don't think we were doing a lot of prior to this time. Um, so, so that's been really fun. It almost seems that there's an increased camaraderie. Yeah, yes, that, that is the word I was looking for. <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I've got the benefit of just listening and coming up with them. You're actually doing the majority of the work here by talking. So <laughs> I've been told I can talk a lot. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I've been told the same thing. So the fact that I have a mute button is great. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. So the last question I love to ask is, do you have a secret talent or something you enjoy doing, which many might not? Yeah, so I I would say I I do think it's still a secret. I've been I've been starting to showcase some more of my work, but I am essentially an 85-year-old woman and I love knitting. <laughs> so 
So uh, I've been doing quite a lot of knitting ever since the pandemic had first started. And in fact, over the summer, I knitted my first sweater in preparation for winter, which was a huge undertaking wow. for me as a person <laughs> who had only ever made scarves. I made a whole sweater. <laughs> Um, I love it. And one of my friends, when I wore it, uh, she came up to me. She goes, oh, wow, Hillary, is that from anthropology? And I just about died. <laughs> um, yes. How, how much would you like for it? I will make you one. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, but, but yeah, I actually love knitting, especially as a person who has anxiety and sometimes just needs to relax. It's a great way to just like put on some music or a documentary and just knit away. Um, I find it so, so rewarding to physically make something. <laughs> so I, I love doing that. Um, and, you know, I, I just like to do other artsy things that I maybe I'm not very good at, but I enjoy like drawing, um, just really anything to zone out the rest of the day and just be able to reflect a little. Uh, but yeah, I love knitting. <laughs> That's great. I, I've attempted it a couple times and I keep uh, it keeps falling to the wayside, but that's that's something that's on my list. There's a couple of things that are on my current list oh, that so I really want to spend some time focusing on, and those are a couple of them. So that's great. <laughs> yeah, I and I finally found a website where uh, their yarn is just to die for. I'm obsessed. Um, so now I have a surplus of yarn, and I maybe need to make more time for knitting. I went a little yarn crazy, <laughs> but. <laughs> Oh. Well, Hillary, thank you so much for taking time to talk with us. I really appreciate you being willing to open up and share your story. And I'm sure that colleagues will connect with it and our listeners will find it really interesting and engaging. Thank you so much. Oh, I hope so. Thank, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you for joining us for this episode of The Veterinary Pulse. Please check the episode notes for additional information referenced in the podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow, subscribe, and share review. We welcome feedback and hope you will tune in again. You can find out more about the VIN Foundation through our website, vinfoundation.org, and our social media channels. Thank you for being here. Be well.